This is part one of chapter five, Cases of Pathological Lying in Borderline Mental Types, in Pathological Lying, Accusation, and Swindling, by William and Mary Healy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mary Schneider. We could load our pages with histories of cases where the statement of delusions, unrecognized as such, has created much trouble in courts and out, but this type of case is too well known to need any illustration. Textbooks of psychiatry deal with the falsifications of paranoia and other insanities, that the really insane also sometimes lie pathologically, that is, tell for no normal purpose what they adequately know to be untrue, is a fact not so well understood. But even that we need not be especially concerned with in our case histories. It has been well brought out in the previous literature on pathological lying, as witness in our chapter two. In the present chapter we do not include the out-and-out -out insane, nor the definitively feeble-minded, nor the recognizably epileptic. Much more difficult of understanding and much less easily recognized because of the mildness of many of the symptoms or their variations from time to time are the types which we enumerate. Several of these offer no complete picture of insanity, even case 25, although clearly aberrational, extremely defective in self-control and markedly criminalistic, did not show to some psychiatrists who observed him a sufficiently clear correspondence to any form of insanity as laid down in the old school textbooks to be practically regarded as insane and in need of long segregation. In considering this whole matter, we must never forget that there is no wall of demarcation between those whose conduct clearly betokens insanity and those who are not insane. There are plenty of instances where the easily passable border between the two is permanently occupied or is at times approached. We keep our borderline cases separate in order to emphasize that pathological lying by an insane person does not make a pathological liar in the true sense. We should hesitate, however, to give in legal form a verdict of insanity in several of these borderline cases we cite. They are very difficult to classify, and the question of responsibility called for sometimes in court work is unanswerable. Keeping even these mild cases away from our others serves, however, to lessen confusion. We need in this subject to conserve all the clearness possible by holding to fundamental classifications and showing up vagueness of definition when it does exist. Perhaps we are over particular in keeping such a case as number 22 in this chapter. The common sense observer would hardly regard this girl as at all lacking, even in self-control. On the other hand, for the purpose of illustrating the subject of pathological accusation, we have kept case 17 in the previous chapter, when it clearly shows great resemblance to case 26 and is in reality a borderline type. Then, too, the swindler, case 12, in some respects belongs in this chapter. We are hardly called on in this work to discuss the lying of drug habitués, although they so frequently in their mental conditions represent borderline types. They are often on the verge of psychosis as the result of their intoxications. Their lying is mostly done for a purpose, to be sure, and hence much would not come under the head of pathological lying, but occasionally veracity is so much interfered with that there seems to be a tendency to aimless lying. This class of cases, however, is sufficiently discussed in special literature pertaining to the subject. Case 22. Summary. A girl of 14, a most vigorous and vivacious personality. Had a couple of years pursued a curiously active career of misrepresentation, of obtaining goods under false pretenses and running away from home even to distant places. Her conversational ability was above normal. Her lies were evolved for the purpose of adapting herself to the peculiar circumstances in which she frequently found herself. Her general conduct, combined with her abnormal psychomotor activity, gave ground for the diagnosis of constitutional excitement, hypomania. Bertie M., 14 years old, we saw after some clever detective work, had proved her to be the girl who in another town had repeatedly swindled shopkeepers. 
it seems she had been accustomed to take the train for localities where she had no connections whatever and there enter shops and make away with whatever she could an astounding incident was when she returned some goods she had stolen and persuaded the manager to refund her money on the same this was regarded by the authorities as extremely clever we found birdie very small for her age weight seventy six pounds height four feet eight inches tonsils very large teeth excessively crowded no sensory defect not yet menstruated a very nervous type quick physical and mental reactions exceedingly active restless manner our psychological impressions state that birdie did all her tests brilliantly and quickly but very often with less accuracy than would have been the case had she taken the time to think quietly rather than work rapidly she was very keen to make the best possible record Quote, I am proud of being quick. Nothing is hard for me. It was not hard at school. End quote. It was found by studying her that she gave a more accurate performance. We diagnosed her ability as good, but her school advantages had been poor. Otherwise, we noted she was a pert, talkative, responsive child of a distinctly nervous and somewhat unreliable type. Her ideas came tumbling, one on top of another. Under close supervision, she was able to control her mental processes fairly well. For instance, on the antonym test, where opposites to 20 stimulus words are called for, Bertie gave them in the remarkably rapid average time of eight-tenths of a second, with only one failure and one error. This is an exceptional record. From this and her unexpected powers of self-control exhibited on some other tests, we were obliged to conclude that her aberrational tendencies were not very deep-set. Her mental traits seemed to conform most nearly to the type designated as constitutional excitement or hypomania. Further observation of the case confirmed us in this first view of it. On the Osage or testimony test, she gave 13 items, all correct, upon free recital. On questioning, 14 more details were added, but six of these were incorrect. Of the six suggestions offered, she accepted none. Bertie immigrated from Austria with her family when she was ten years of age. She came of a healthy family. All of her grandparents and many of her uncles and aunts are living. We get no history of any insanity, epilepsy, or feeble-mindedness on either side. She is one of seven children, several of whom have had nervous troubles. Two of the children had convulsions in infancy, but then only. One brother at ten years of age is an excessive stammerer and extremely nervous. Bertie was born after a pregnancy during which the mother was much worried and in poor health. The father, too, was sickly at that time. The family conditions were defective on account of poverty and illness during a large share of the period when the children were born. Bertie at birth was very small and there was difficulty in resuscitation. She, however, was never seriously ill until she was seven years of age when she had something like peritonitis. No spasms or convulsions at any time. She was a very small child during her infancy, but walked at eight months and talked very well indeed when she was only one year old. Developmental history otherwise negative, but all along there has been poor family control on account of ill health and the slight earning capacity of the father. During the several months we knew Bertie, she was always a most unreliable person. She repeatedly ran away from home and was lost track of. On one occasion, she got as far as Omaha. By the use of elaborate but plausible stories, she always succeeded in winning the friendship of reputable people. Once she was found, after she had been away several weeks, residing in a good home in another state where the people thought of adopting her on account of her brightness. Many times she wandered about her home city, and in the most active and sly fashion purloined anything she cared for. Several times when she was taken by the police, she invented clever stories without the least faltering that seemed entirely fitted to the occasion. As the investigator said, she talked incessantly with not the slightest hesitation and was always airy and sure. No one to whom she had gone with her misrepresentations questioned her veracity. She always came out with a clearly connected and plausible story. We noted that her parents, in comparison, seemed quite stupid. Of course, Bertie passed under various names. 
Once we recognized her picture in the newspaper representing a weary, disheartened girl who was tired walking all day long from one employment bureau to another. She stated to the reporter it was her ambition to become a model servant. When in Omaha, her mental peculiarities were recognized and she was studied by a competent alienist who, however, was not willing to render a verdict of non compos mentis to the police. This was when she had run away from Chicago and had told a lot of stories, all of which had turned out to be untrue. The trouble which she created in various communities by reason of her hyperactive delinquencies has not been small. With much merriment and an excessive amount of facial expression, this little girl held forth to us. It is hardly necessary to say that the account varied somewhat from day to day. She did not like it at home and did not propose to go back there. There were too many in the family. As soon as the floor was scrubbed, one of the children would get it all dirty again. She had started for New York, but the old gatekeeper at the station was mean, and she could not slip by him. She got along all right in Omaha, but finally she gave herself up to the police there. She thinks perhaps she might go to the people in Wisconsin who wanted to adopt her. In any case, she can do a great deal better than Viola B., who ran away from New York and got caught and was so much talked about in the newspapers. Thus her story would run along at great length, Bertie in the meanwhile chuckling with the thought of her own escapades. We never recommended institutional life because it seemed as if better things might be done for this girl. We felt that if she were built up from a physical standpoint, her tendency towards nervous excitement might grow less. Her tonsils were removed. Everyone felt that the girl's good mental abilities should be conserved to the utmost. Attempts at management in a different environment gave some hope of success, and after a time her parents moved to a smaller town where we lost oversight of the girl. Following our acquaintance with the case, it had been managed in the light of her characteristics, and her falsifying tendencies were constantly discounted by those in charge. We felt that her tendency was to grow more stable. Three years later, we have just gained further information concerning Bertie. The family is still in straitened circumstances, the father having proved too weak a character to support them. He posed as somewhat of a gentleman and made off to another country. Bertie is said to have worked steadily for months at a time, but over a year ago suddenly left home once more, this time going with a stage company. Although the police in several cities have been appealed to, no trace has been obtained as yet of our young friend. Whether her lying was continued at home we cannot satisfactorily learn, nor do we know accurately about any continuance of her state of excitement, but without doubt Bertie in her present wandering is fabricating anew, and is what she was before, namely, a young adventuress. Case card case 22 girl age 14 years mental conditions constitutional excitement developmental conditions defective pregnancy early impaction of teeth poor general physical conditions home conditions poverty irritability of father and mother delinquencies running away stealing lying mentality ability good constitutional excitement case 23 summary a girl of 16, having been out all of one night, related a story to the police of having been led off and incidentally made the statement that she had been repeatedly immoral, once with a relative. She dictated and signed a detailed account of the affairs, giving times and places. This was used in investigating and led to much fruitless effort, even on the part of experienced people. Her story was quite untrue. When studied, she proved to be a mild case of chorea, exhibiting the typical psychotic tendencies of that disease, such as we have observed in court work a number of times. Nellie M., when brought to us by her grandmother, following the girl's experience with the police, who had been told by her of immoralities practiced, was found to be rather a nice-looking and gentle girl, pleasant and responsive with us. On the physical side, we found her to be poorly developed and nourished. Weight, 93 pounds, height, 4 feet 9 inches. Vision, about 20-40 in each eye, but wears glasses which correct this. Rather poor color. Complains somewhat of headaches. Marked tremor of outstretched hands. Moderate amount of choreic movements in arms and legs. Exaggerated when attention distracted. 
knee jerks exaggerated conjunctival and palatal reflexes almost absent small regular features well-shaped head said to drink at least four cups of tea a day heart sounds negative mentally she seemed to be fairly normal in ability but was undoubtedly in a peculiar psychical condition she had reached seventh grade in spite of much moving about even to different cities we found evidence of lack of good apperceptive powers and the history of the case led us to see clearly that she had been just recently in a very unstable if not quite confusional mental condition the osage or testimony test was not given in this case the history of heredity and development shows many points of importance the mother died when nellie was a very little girl she was terribly abused by a husband who was excessively alcoholic and in general a tremendous brute they lived in a roadhouse where drunken fights were not uncommon nellie has been brought up since her mother's death by other relatives outside of alcoholism on the father's side there is said to be no family peculiarities the mother came from a very reputable family nellie suffered early from several severe illnesses when only six weeks old she is said to have been in a comatose condition with scarlet fever and diphtheria later she had measles whooping cough and other mild ailments and at one time suffered extremely from constipation walked and talked early no convulsions menstruated first several months ago sometimes complains of severe headaches one observer reported that the girl had been subject to slight melancholia within the last year Choreic movements have been present off and on for about a year, but have not been marked until a little while previous to the incident which brought her to us. The diagnosis has been made that it was a case of mild St. Vitus dance. During all the year, Nellie has been regarded as in general unreliable, but nothing of importance had happened prior to the above episode. Nellie's story, as told to us, seemed coherent enough apparently she had entire memory of her past actions and in general of what she had said her own statements convinced us as much as anything else of her unreliability at times it seems she had run away and gone to a picture show and had fallen asleep there when she got out it was very late but it was election night and people were about on the streets she finally was accosted by a woman who took her home after her story of being led off by a man, the police were called into the case, and she gave them her remarkable statement. Nellie told us of picking up with a man, too, who lured her to a theater, but who left her there. There was no way of corroborating this. She fully acknowledged to us the lies which had created so much trouble. Quote, well, I was telling the first lies, and then I was going to tell him that I knew that I was telling wrong. He acted so cranky and said such things to me. He said he knew somebody had done bad things to me, and so I thought I had to give the name of somebody, and so I gave those names. The girls around in the schools I used to go to talked about these things. I never went with them. I was always by myself none of the boys said bad things the police were so cranky i did not know what else to say they said someone must have done it to me when i was younger and i said it was my cousin because he always used to want to he said he would give me a pair of skates if i would he was thirteen i never asked my grandmother or anyone about these things no one ever explained it to me just the girls are the ones who told me about these things they told me themselves how they had been out at night with boys. I never did do it with anybody. End quote. Examination by a gynecologist about this time showed positively that there had been no immoral relations, and after our findings the case became a closed incident so far as prosecuting anybody was concerned. Nellie was taken in hand by the family physician, and no further delinquencies or false accusations have been complained of during the succeeding two years. Outside the girl's general frank bearing, undoubtedly a point rather indicating to the police possible truth in her statements, was the detail in which the alleged events were given. The signed statement coming from an apparently naive girl of fifteen would seem in its clearness and coherency to bear the earmarks of truth. We always regarded this case as one of our interesting examples, showing the unreliability of girl witnesses, especially those who have had unfortunate experiences, even though merely mental, with sex affairs. Case card. Case 23, girl age 15 years. 
mentality mild choreic psychosis early clandestine sex teachings delinquencies running away and false accusations mentality normal ability temporary aberration case twenty four summary a girl of sixteen whose general conditions won ready sympathy created much trouble she repeatedly made serious accusations against a man and her attempt at suicide made her statement seem convincing further study showed the absolute falsity of her charges it was a case of hysteria which had developed largely upon a basis of injury there was a traumatic psychoneurosis under good treatment she made a fine recovery there being no more indulgence in pathological accusations although her nervous symptoms recurred for a short time after a couple of years at the time when we first saw georgia b she was somewhat over sixteen years old and had been only five years in this country we saw her because she had run away from home and attempted suicide from the latter she had been rescued and then had accused a neighbor of raping her the case proved to be very troublesome until the nature of the whole affair was understood we found a thin and anemic girl not at all prepossessing in appearance dull in expression suffering from a chronic superating otitis media on the mental side we had much trouble in conducting an examination because she was greatly given to tears she did work for us on a few tests and her efforts would have been graded as those of a feeble-minded person if her emotional state had been left out of the account even our physical examination was largely hindered through her crying however her story was told in a straightforward way and with that show of emotion which had previously convinced others that grave injustice had been done her distinct proof of hysteria was present for instance on one occasion in the middle of a test georgia apparently became unconscious her head dropped to the table but her lips were red her face did not change color she resisted having her head moved and in a moment or two lifted it herself to a more comfortable position the diagnosis from such symptoms as these and from her history was not difficult to make the osage test for obvious reasons was not given georgia told her story with surprising coherency in outline it was as follows she ran away from home and then was put under protection of the police authorities by a man who caught her she said she was caught when standing by a drug store where she had been to get medicine just ten cents worth of peroxide when asked by us if it were not really carbolic acid she called for she said yes it was and that she intended to take it she wanted to get rid of her life what could she do in the way of living her father and mother were both sick and they could not live long and then how would she get along taking care of three little children when asked if her parents would not be terribly affected by her suicide she said that it would not be the first time they had buried a child at this time she would go no further into her history on the next day she talked straight to the point but with a remarkably dull expression on her face she said that about five weeks ago she cannot tell the exact date she went to a neighbor's house a man there wanted her to come and look at some pictures he finally got her to go to the bedroom and then held her so she could not scream and raped her she is sure of it he later choked and beat her and kicked her out of the house at first she was afraid to tell her people a couple of weeks afterward she went back and asked why he did that and he swore at her and accused her of being bad and she and he talked back and forth for some time quote, he says i'll kill you i did not touch you at all i says you did you're a liar and you can kill me now if you want to you've already killed me see i grow large like this End quote. he then set upon her and beat her again she has not seen him since after telling this georgia began to cry very hard and said that she really is killed now and done for the whole story was told in a straightforward way with a full show of emotion a complicating feature of this case resultant upon lack of understanding of the characteristic vagaries of this type was the action of a vigorous knight errant he was the one who rescued her hearing her ask in the drug store for the carbolic acid which she did not get he followed her until she got to the river and then when she had her foot on the rail of the bridge and was about to jump off he seized her she fought and kicked him so that she badly hurt one of his legs 
She told him she had reason to commit suicide. He got her to some house, and there she fainted. When she had come to, she described her situation to him, naming a man who boarded with a neighbor as having raped her. She told him this was the reason she had tried to commit suicide. This young man visited George's family, found them strangely indifferent and not inclined to believe the girl, so he set out to see that justice was done. With his well-intended efforts, he succeeded in getting several agencies to work on the case, the parents, meanwhile, partly resenting his interference. They said they knew what kind of a girl she was. We never felt thoroughly satisfied with the family history on account of the comparative ignorance of the parents, our only source of information, although they were honest enough people. All points in heredity seemed negative, nor could we learn that there had been anything significant in developmental conditions. The girl had only recently menstruated. Her people felt that of late her word was quite unreliable. She went as far as the fourth grade. On account of the short time in school in this country, this was considered doing fairly well. Ten months prior, she had fallen off a streetcar. It was not known she was damaged seriously. A jury had given a verdict of several hundred dollars against the company, but on account of an appeal having been taken, the case was still unsettled. Since the accident, a number of fainting attacks had occurred, and Georgia had lost one position on account of them, a place where she had worked for two years. She was said to have been quite healthy before the accident. Some five weeks before we saw her, the girl had become hysterical and announced that she had not menstruated the week before, and the cause was that she had been raped. Her behavior was so peculiar in regard to this that her parents did not believe her statements and did nothing about it. The girl evidently was accustomed to telling falsehoods, although we could get no specific account of them. The parents were very anxious to avoid a scandal, for though they were poor, they made much of their respectability. Georgia was examined after a later reiteration of her charges. The physician said that she had not been raped. After we saw her, the parents thought it was best to go to another physician with the young man who had become so interested. Once more, the report was that there had been no rape, but it now appeared that there had been some manipulation of the parts. After this, the case quieted down, but Georgia had run away again just before this second examination. When by our recommendation she was now placed in a convalescent home, she repeated the same stories and announced that she was pregnant. Of course, more trouble was created by this, and a third examination had to be made to convince these good people she had been recently asked to interest themselves in her. After her stay in the convalescent home, Georgia returned to her parents, and appearing to be recovered, went to work again. Her record for two years was unexpectedly satisfactory. When the above episode had blown over, she regained control of herself, adapted herself to family conditions, and worked steadily. On one occasion, her nervous symptoms have returned with much depression, and again an attempt at suicide. She was now carefully studied in a hospital for signs of insanity, but again it was determined that she was not of unsound mind. She made a speedy recovery, adjusted herself once more to her surroundings, and after a few months became married. During the last year or so, there has been no further trouble. A settlement of the lawsuit for injuries was made before her more recent period of depression. At the time of even her last attack, we can learn of no more false accusations having been made. The family attitude about her has all along not been what it should have been to have gained the proper results, but the problem of poverty was always with them. Case card. Case 24. Girl, age 16 years. Mentality. Traumatic psychoneurosis. Accident with lawsuit following general physical conditions, anemia, poor nutrition, otitis media, delinquencies, running away, attempted suicide, false accusations, mentality, poor ability, temporary aberration. This is the end of part one of chapter five, recorded by Mary Schneider. Part 2 of Chapter 5, Cases of Pathological Lying in Borderline Mental Types In Pathological Lying, Accusation, and Swindling by William and Mary Healy This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mary Schneider K. 
Case 25. Summary. Case of a young man of 19 with already a long record of criminalism who created much trouble for the court where a judge was keenly anxious to do justice. The fellow implicated himself in a sensational murder, but investigation proved this to be untrue. In other ways, his word was found most unreliable. The question concerning his sanity could only be answered by stating that he was an aberrational type peculiarly inclined to criminalism and therefore needed segregation, and that he was also given to pathological lying and self-accusation. From the legal and social standpoints, it is important to note that the case represents a type unquestionably abnormal, although the mental pathology could not be subsumed under the head of any one of the designated mental diseases. The case of John B. was studied at the request of a judge who had continued the trial because of the manifest mental peculiarities of the defendant. We were told that his behavior varied much, that one day he would cry and apologize, and on another would show stupid bravado. As the judge stated, John had long been in disciplinary institutions, and this had failed to do any good. The immediately peculiar features of the case were that while he was being held for vagrancy and robbery, John made a strong attempt to implicate himself in a murder case. In other words, he was a self-accuser. We found a strong young man of 19 years, weight 157 pounds, height 5 feet 5 inches, very broad-shouldered and deep-chested but slouchy attitude, good color, eyes bright, varicocele, somewhat defective vision in one eye, well-shaped head, circumference 56.5, length 18.5, and breadth 16 centimeters thick heavy voice appears dull and depressed but energizes under encouragement other physical examination negative complains merely of headaches in left frontal region but says he has had these only since last year when he was struck there by a beer bottle recently an excessive user of tobacco in the mental examination we found much of interest when first seen he gave every appearance of being a mental defective but by judicious stimulation he could be waked up to do comparatively good work in several directions on the bidet tests 1911 series he passed all but one of the twelve year set in that he followed the suggestion offered on the fifteen year old tests he did three out of five the failures were on the memory span of figures and in the repetition of a sentence of twenty six syllables by our other tests, we also found him defective in verbal memory processes, even when he read the passage to be remembered. In working with our so-called construction tests, where his success depended not only upon planning with concrete material, but even more on the ability to profit by his failures, he did decidedly poorly. In handling the puzzle box, where above everything is required perception of the relationship of one step to another, he succeeded very rapidly. With the cross-line tests, which require mental representation of an easily remembered figure and analysis of its parts, he did very poorly, succeeding only after the third attempt in each of the two simple tests. This is a type of work that is especially easy for the normal person. In our Osage or testimony test, we got a decidedly poor result. At first enumeration, he gave only eight items, and on cross-questioning, gave only six more. He denied seeing other objects plain in the picture, but contradicted himself somewhat on this. It is interesting that he took only one of our four suggestions, notwithstanding his suggestibility on the Binet test. On school work, he does altogether much better. He writes a good hand, reads fairly well, and promptly does a sum in long division. He claims to have reached the sixth grade. One difficulty in testing him was his prevailing lethargy. We constantly had to fight this by encouragement. Once he insisted he must give up the work because he had not had a smoke for an hour or so. Altogether, including his irregularities, we could not call him lower than poor in ability, possibly subnormal. He did not come within the limits of the feeble-minded group. Just where to place him would depend upon what he perhaps could do under other more favorable conditions. So much for the tests of ability. In studying him for aberrational tendencies, there were positive indications. 
most significant it was when in the binet tests he came to the word justice and turned to the examiner saying feelingly i don't know what that is and then burst into tears yet this was from a fellow who had offered to get himself into even worse trouble with the courts he made much of his worrying about not having any home and not being the child of his so-called parents his attitude was of sorrow and hopelessness about his whole situation in life as seen again about two weeks later still more evidences of aberration were found he contradicted himself then in regard to his previous stories in regard to his home life denied he had made self-accusations and very clearly did not remember at all accurately what he had previously told me in fact he evidently was not quite clear just who i was although he had before been brought across town under the charge of a couple of officers to see me an important break in his incarceration he also told a different story from one he had told before to a certain official who now was present he seemed rather mixed on a number of points and this is all the more significant because he had been heartily afraid of being adjudged insane our diagnosis at this point was purely tentative as far as exact diagnosis was concerned we stated that in our opinion he was an aberrational type and the practical point was that he should neither be allowed to go out in the community nor be sent to a penitentiary but rather to an institution for observation and perhaps for long detention the jury found it necessary as usual in such cases to declare him insane the history of john runs as follows from an evidently conscientious parent we learn nothing significant in the family history at birth he was said to be bright and healthy he had diphtheria severely at four years at six he started to school he always got along well in his classes but was very troublesome at eleven years he began to run away from home his father spent much time and money in going to various parts of the country for him and at thirteen years of age he was placed in an industrial school he is the only child he came home after two years remained there for three or four months and then ran away once more to california his home was in the middle west he was returned by the police sent to the industrial school for another year and then again returned home he stayed only two weeks before running away to new york coming back he got into some trouble and was sent for the third time to the industrial school there he stayed until six months before we saw him he was released once more on parole stayed at home a week and again ran away it is reported that during his early time at the industrial school he was rather melancholy by spells and at one time tried to poison himself his relatives say he has a bad temper he had typhoid fever at fourteen but made a good recovery john has been known for years as a great liar having told miserable stories about his parents all of which were quite untrue he has frequently mortified his father and mother by denying his parentage the last time john was on parole he wrote more than one letter to police authorities in his home state informing them that he had been implicated in a serious crime an officer at the reformatory institution had a letter from him purporting to be written from a penitentiary stating he was sentenced there on a charge of robbery when he was held in our city on a minor charge he informed the police officials that he was connected with a certain notorious murder of which the papers had been full just previously he was sent out with a couple of detectives who soon found he knew nothing about the actual facts and that his alleged accomplices were innocent men in jail it is reported that he seems childish he has to be locked up alone at times and then begs and teases to get out but in ten minutes or so will repeat the bad behavior he has stolen little things from others in custody and has attempted to dispose of his own clothes for a few cents it is definitely reported that he has shown evidences of poor memory from the institution where he previously had been so long word comes that he was regarded there as not quite normal john had been held in another city on a charge of rape but without much evidence for he was allowed to go we could not find out whether he made self-accusations in that case in his story to us he complains bitterly about his treatment at the old institution maintains he was head laundry man there tells about his excessive smoking of late denies his parentage says the only friend he has is a certain church worker maintains he did not have any home to go to from the industrial school 
intimates he will commit suicide if there is any question of his being declared insane says that he had earlier stolen things from home tells of having spells when things get black in front of his eyes and can't see for a little while says he wants to be sent to the penitentiary and wants to start right now serving his term all told there was nothing so striking about this whole case as the extravagant tendencies towards prevarication for years he had been lying to no purpose although he has never been previously regarded as insane now he appears as an extreme self-accuser and as a fellow whose word can't be trusted from hour to hour the lying regarded as an aberrational tendency is out of proportion to our findings of abnormality in any other sphere of mental activity except perhaps the evidences of defective memory processes one trouble engaging his memory is of course the boy's prevarications but one might argue that if his memory processes were as good as his other abilities he would make equal use of them following our study and recommendation in the case john was found not guilty but insane then being resident of another state and indeed being on parole from a reformatory institution there he was held over to the jurisdiction of that state and placed in a hospital for the criminal insane we have a full report from the latter place which is exceedingly illuminating it appears that despite his first terror of being sent to an asylum he adapted himself to this new surroundings very readily it is stated that he assisted with the ward work and spent his leisure time in reading and playing cards he asked for work outside on the grounds and was regarded as a very courteous and genial patient no evidence of delusional or hallucinatory trends could be obtained he always seemed to be well oriented and conscious of everything going on about him emotionally he appeared somewhat subnormal inasmuch as he did not worry about his own condition but said he was perfectly contented the latter of course to a psychiatrist would be significant he was a great talker and his stories were well listened to john said that when he was indicted for robbery his lawyer advised him to feign insanity and as a result he had been sent to that hospital it is to be remembered that with us he made a great effort to show off his mental powers at their best and evidently did somewhat better work than when later in the hospital he gave them a history of being somewhat a cocainist or morphinist of being a slick pickpocket and of associating with prominent criminals particularly auto bandits he was boastful of his experiences but sometimes admitted that he prevaricated it is most interesting to note that he told a story of having concealed in chicago some plunder jewels money and so on and was really taken to chicago by one of the board of visitors of the hospital to find the booty it is hardly necessary to say it was not located the last of the hospital report states quote, inasmuch as we were unable to prove that he had any form of insanity he was discharged End quote it is of no small importance for discussion of the relation between insanity and criminalism to know that there are such cases as this where the individual is unquestionably aberrational and yet does not conform in mental symptoms to any one of the definitive forms of insanity they may be lacking in normal social control and inability to reason impulsively inclined to antisocial deeds and therefore social menaces but notwithstanding this may not be classified under the head of any of the ordinary textbook types of mental diseases it is clear that for the protection of society a different notion of what constitutes mental aberration or insanity should prevail so that these unusually dangerous types might be permanently segregated it would really seem that just the findings which the hospital statement enumerates would convince one of this individual's marked abnormality from a social point of view and that his being at large was a grave undesirability the latest information concerning this young man is that he was being held in a western city for burglary we should hesitate to make out a card of causative factors in this case it is clear that the major cause of his delinquency was his aberrational mentality what there was by way of causation back of this our history although obtained from an apparently conscientious parent is too meager for explanation case twenty six summary boy of sixteen had for six years 
caused a great amount of trouble by his general unreliability and excessive lying. He had been tried away from his own people in private homes and in institutions without success. His lying was excessive and often showed no purpose and no foresight. His peculiar delinquencies demonstrated weakness of will. Although in good general physical condition, he simulated illnesses. Mental and physical characteristics rendered certain the diagnosis of constitutional inferiority. We saw William S. first when he was over 16 years of age, after he had been arrested for stealing. He had already been in three institutions for delinquents. From his father and others, we gained a long story of the case. William was in fairly good physical condition, no sensory defect, weight 125 pounds, height 5 feet 3 inches. Although well enough developed in other ways, he was a marked case of delayed puberty, as yet no pubescence. Strength only fair for his age, muscles decidedly flabby. A high, broad forehead, large nose, peculiar curl of the upper lip, small, weak chin, these features give him a peculiar appearance, readily interpretable as showing weakness of character. Cranium notably large, with small amount of hair, measurements were circumference 57.8, length 19.6, breadth 15.5 centimeters, head same size as father's. Expression downcast, voice high-pitched, underdog attitude, slouchy no analgesia or other signs of hysteria the performance on tests was peculiarly irregular in this monograph we have omitted discussion of the results of separate tests but the citation of the summary as dictated when the case was first studied will prove instructive the work done on our tests was very irregular peculiarly so Perceptions good and most phases of the memory processes fair, but in reasoning ability and especially in tests which require the application of some foresight, the results are poor indeed. The failure is remarkable in proportion to what he could do in schoolwork and to his abilities in some other ways. He reads fluently, writes a good hand, and in arithmetic is able to do long division, but showed no grasp of good method. When, at his best, he sticks at a job well enough, but does it with no intelligence and does not save himself in the least by thoughtful procedures. We were interested to note that in a game which he said he had played a great deal, namely checkers, he made the most foolish and short-sighted moves. It is only fair to say that this boy varied in his performance from time to time. His emotional condition largely controlled his performance. On the Osage or testimony test, he gave a functional account upon free recital with 15 details. On questioning, he gave 13 more items. Out of the entire number, only three minor errors. Of five suggestions proffered, none was accepted. There was a great deal more to be said about this boy's mental peculiarities than what was evidenced by the giving of tests. Our observations of him made at intervals over a period of several months corroborated entirely the statements of several others, including members of his own family. The boy was remarkably unstable in his ideas and purposes. What he apparently sincerely wanted to do and be at one time was entirely different at another. His changeableness was shown in many ways. When he had found apparently suitable employment or a new home, he often would stay only a few days. The father's first statement that the boy was a craven was borne out by all that we saw. He was too cowardly to be a tough, but he was a persistent runaway and vagrant. He sometimes used an assumed name. In general demeanor, he was good-natured, but always restless. Not the least of his peculiarities was his ready weeping. It was amazing to see so large a fellow draw down in his chin and sob like a young child. He was easily frightened at night. Under observation, he had peculiar episodes of behavior. Once in a schoolroom, without any known provocation, he suddenly began to cry and scream, picked up a chair, and soon had the entire room cleared out. A moment afterwards, he was found sobbing and bewailing his lot because he, quote, never had a fair chance, unquote. On another occasion, his legs strangely gave out, and he had to be carried to bed by his fellows. 
the next morning a physician found him with his legs drawn up and apparently very sensitive over his back and other parts of his body but with a little encouragement all his symptoms soon disappeared he gave a history of having had convulsions but this was found to be untrue he was a bluffer among boys when met valiantly showed always great cowardice we felt much inclined at first to denominate him a case of abulia but his stubbornness and recalcitrancy led us to change our opinion from the above physical signs and mental phenomena he was clearly a constitutional inferior some facts we obtained on the family history were most significant the mother of william suffered from attacks which were undoubtedly epileptic her mother in turn had convulsions at least during one pregnancy we did not learn whether or not she had them at other times no other points of significance in that family are known the father himself was brought up as he says strictly but he was inclined to be wild and he has indulged for many years altogether too much in tobacco and alcohol he is distinctly a weak type and the poorest specimen of his family william is the only child there was nothing peculiar in developmental history until he was two and a half years old when he suffered from quote, brain fever and spinal meningitis end quote. this was said to have left him with a stiff right arm and to account for his being left-handed we could discover no difference in the reflexes then at another period he was sick in bed for six months with some unknown but not very serious illness the mother has been dead for years and so we were unable to get accurate details about this at a very early age william sought the pleasures of tobacco even when a child of six or seven he used his pennies for that purpose he was brought up in an environment defective on account of his father being a poor earner and weak in discipline but still his parent took for years a great deal of interest in him and it was not until the boy had proven himself most difficult that his father proclaimed himself unable to manage his son at about ten years of age william began running away from home and manufacturing untrue stories one of his favorite statements was that his father had been killed in an accident it is notable that all these years he has been attempting to gain sympathy for this or that assumed condition whether it be for his own alleged physical ailments or fictitious family difficulties as a matter of fact during this time he has been in some good homes failing each time to comport himself so that he could be retained there it was typical that he reiterated quote, i have no friends there is no one to stick up for me End quote besides being in three institutions before he was sixteen years old william had been in homes which he had found when he had run away or in which he had been placed by his father or by social agencies the services of which had been evoked his stealing was often done with an extraordinary lack of foresight for instance in one good position that had been found for him he took a box of cigars when of course as the newcomer he would have been suspected and even after his employers made it clear to him that they knew of the theft he took another box the next day his lying under all occasions was nothing short of astonishing to even his best friends he offered all sorts of fabulous tales which one iota of forethought would have made him realize would redound to his disadvantage almost his only show of common sense in this was when he gave an assumed name while getting a new position and even this performance could hardly be considered deeply rational it is hardly necessary to give lengthy specimens of his falsifications they always pervaded his stories about himself but strangely enough he acknowledged many of his delinquencies a good example of the latter was when he collected a little money for a new employer and on the way back looking in a shop window saw an electrical toy and immediately bought it he then went home not even returning to the office to get the wages which were due him an example of his lying in his responses to questions about his schooling he maintained that he only reached the third grade in reality he could do sixth grade work at least he said quote, i know long division by about thirteen and about five figures i don't know it by any other numbers End quote. william maintained these same characteristics over the six years during which we have had good data about him we know he continued the same kind of a career for a year or so afterwards three years later we have direct information from his family concerning william his habits of prevarication have been kept up steadily so it is stated 
he has been in and out of institutions and at present is serving a sentence for larceny he all along has been unwilling to face realities and has lied against his own interests continually for instance we are told that if he lost a place instead of obtaining the help his family would have been willing to give him in gaining another he would steadily pretend to be holding the former position he is still considered utterly unreliable and a thoroughly weak character with a tendency to meet a situation as readily by a lie as another person would tend to react by speaking the truth people who have known him of late speak of him as being at twenty-one just the same fellow which probably indicates that he is thoroughly a victim of habit formation as well as of innate tendencies case card case twenty six boy age sixteen years mentality typical constitutional inferior heredity mother epileptic maternal grandmother had convulsions father alcoholic and tobacco in excess weak type developmental conditions early disease of the central nervous system delinquencies running away stealing lying mentality abilities irregular psychic episodes case twenty seven summary case of a boy aged sixteen years who told the most extraordinary stories of his vagrant life and the character of his family to officers of several organizations who tried to help him he understood well that evidences of his unreliability would count against him his stories although often repeated were not credited and later after a home had been found for him he began a new series of lies that seemed almost delusional and somewhat paranoidal after months during which much had been done for him it was suddenly discovered that he was an epileptic john f appealed to an agency for assistance he told a story of having wandered with his brother since he was a young boy Quote, my father was insane from what my uncle did to my mother he drowned her the house caught on fire and he blamed her for it she said she didn't she was too sick to get up and he took her out of the house and his big son pumped water on her she was pretty near dead anyhow we was too little to do anything i seen it i remember that all right you can see that yet brother and sister died about three years ago brother took sick from sleeping out we slept around in barns for two years father was in an insane hospital in kansas i think my uncle was hanged in north junction we did not stay there i remember yet when they went to put my mother in the grave i jumped in with her we put right out and after a while folks wrote that father was dead End quote. so much attention would not have been paid to this gruesome tale had it not been repeated to various people during the course of several months the boy wrote letters reiterating these incidents his stories always went on to include the most surprising amount of abuse it seemed that everywhere he had been ill-treated farmers had whipped him or clothed him badly or defrauded him of his wages physically we found john to be in good general condition a strong active country boy no serious defect of any kind was discovered on mental tests he did better than we expected to be sure he was very backward in arithmetic but then his story was that he had hardly ever been to school at all he certainly did well in many of our tests with concrete material but the results as a whole were curiously irregular even if we allowed for his deficient schooling at that time we were disinclined to pass ultimate judgment on his mentality without knowing more about his antecedents on the osage test only eleven bare items on free recital on questioning nineteen more details were added of the entire number only three were incorrect and these were not serious mistakes of six suggestions offered he accepted three the history of this boy and his family has never been forthcoming the authorities in his alleged home state have not been able to trace his family which they could have done had his stories been true their report made it clear that the boy's reiterated family history was a fabrication the raison d'etre of which is still in doubt in spite of his lying the boy was found a desirable home in the country at the work for which he was suited after staying for a few weeks he returned to the city and got lodgings for himself we next heard of him because he was induced by a hold-up man to secrete a revolver on his person while the police were in the neighborhood upon looking up his landlady it was found that while with her he had suffered from epileptic attacks 
These had not been observed during the several months we had previously known him, and he had strangely denied them to us. In our court work, we constantly inquire for evidences of epilepsy. In this case, we received nothing but negation. After he served his sentence, this young man was lost sight of. Even in the institution to which he had been sent, he continued his fanciful and often hideous stories, still largely centered about the idea that he had suffered unjustly wherever he had been. No complete summary of causative factors is possible in this case. The major cause for his lying, as well as other delinquencies, particularly his vagrancy, is, of course, the mental traits peculiar to epilepsy. This is the end of Part 2 of Chapter 5 and the end of Chapter 5 as a whole. Recorded by Mary Schneider. Chapter 6, Conclusions, in Pathological Lying, Accusation, and Swindling, by William and Mary Healy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 6, Conclusions, Characteristics of the Individual Diagnosis, Physical Findings. Our 19 mentally normal cases, 18 females and 1 male, showed good general condition 14 fair general condition 2 poor general condition 1 poor development 2 poor development undersized for age 2 defective vision 6 headaches 4 mild nervous symptoms 2 tonsils and adenoids 3 fainting attacks 1 gynecological ailments 6 abdominal tumor etc 1 hutchinsonian teeth 2 stigmata of degeneracy three premature sex development two comparing the above with the findings by previous writers we see little chance to draw safe deductions so many of the foreign cases have been insane they can be more nearly compared with our seven borderline types where all sorts of physical conditions may be found it is notable that a large percentage of our mentally normal cases are in good general condition Defective vision in six cases may be only a coincidence, but perhaps resulting nervous irritation was sometimes a factor in producing misconduct. Headaches, which Stemmerman makes so much of, appear as an incident in only a small number of our cases. Her emphasis on periodicity also we cannot corroborate. There are hints of it in only one or two instances, but then her cases for the most part are not comparable to ours. That six out of eighteen females should have had severe gynecological ailments is not to be wondered at, considering the trend of their lives, but in turn there can be little doubt that, as in cases 16, 18, and 21, the local irritation tended to bring about moral disabilities. Mental Findings Considering first the question of mental capabilities, we can classify our 19 normal cases as follows supernormal inability two precocious later still considered right one good ability six fair ability perhaps not quite up to the former classes six poor ability one poor ability hysterical type one poor in general but with artistic and literary ability one dull from physical causes but later normal one over and beyond the above enumeration there were some intensely interesting facts which came out during the intimate study of these cases we are at once forced to agree with previous writers that an unusual number of the pathological liar group show great aptitude for language this is shown by their general conversational ability and by the fact that many of them have found out themselves that they had capacity for instance for writing compositions Taking our group of pathological liars in the strict sense, as given in Chapter 3, we find that no less than seven of these twelve had been given to writing compositions and stories. Three of them had definitely commenced long stories or novels. It is most unusual, among other offenders, to find evidence of any such tendencies. A considerable number of our group were characterized as great talkers, and several as romantic, dramatic, fantastic, etc., even by ordinary observers. 
all this goes to show clearly that the native traits making for verbal fluency are strongly correlated with pathological lying when it comes to consideration of such an instance as case eleven we have the point more strongly brought out here the individual is fairly swung down his life's course as the irregularity of his capacities direct his language ability carries him along as nothing else will in corroboration of this interesting point the conclusions of other authors should be noted the aberrational types which show pathological lying are several of them depicted in our chapter six but little in summary of them needs to be said the general mental and moral weakness of the constitutional inferior very naturally leads him to become a pathological liar he follows by virtue of his make-up the path of immediate least resistance lying the episodic lying or aimless false accusations of the choraic psychosis needs no comment the confusional mental state sometimes accompanying that disease readily predisposes toward fantastic treatment of realities the relationship of constitutional excitement to pathological lying is less well recognized but fully explicable when we recollect the rate at which ideas present themselves in the mental content of such individuals who have little time as it were to discriminate the true from the false the mental conditions leading to purposeless prevarication which supervene in the real hysterical mental states or during the course of traumatic psychoneurosis are well known the individual is to be surely regarded as least temporarily as suffering from a psychosis in many of these instances and falsification while it may be difficult to distinguish between delusion and lying is a well recognized phenomenon the very deliberate lying of psychopathic individuals such as case twenty five who though so strongly aberrational do not fit under the head of any of the classic insanities is a matter for earnest consideration by all who have to deal with delinquents there is altogether too little general knowledge of this type of fact the correlation of the various epileptic mental states with pathological lying is well recognized in many of the cases cited by foreign writers it has turned out that the individual was subject to epileptic seizures it is another illustration of the great variety of epileptic phenomena something of a point has been made in the literature heretofore that abnormalities of sexual life are unduly correlated with the inclination to pathological lying and the conclusion is sometimes drawn as by stemmermann that the two prove a degenerative tendency our material would not tend to show this nearly as much as it would prove that the psychical peculiarities follow on a profound upset caused by unfortunate sex experiences a characteristic of pathological liars is undoubtedly a deep-set egocentrism as risch states if one goes over our cases it may be seen that there is exhibited frequently in the individual an undue amount of self-assertion there is very little sympathy for the concerns of others and indeed remarkably little apperception of the opinions of others how frequently the imagery of the heroic role of the self recurs and how frequently it occupies a central stronghold is seen by the fact that nearly all of our cases indubitably demonstrate the phenomenon most of our cases have been studied by the application of a wide range of tests indeed many of the individuals have been studied over and over it is beyond our point at present to go over the separate findings because there is no evidence of a strong correlation of any type of peculiarity except the ones mentioned here with the pathological lying memory processes for instance as ordinarily tested seem to be normally acute we have naturally been much interested in the result of the osage or testimony test work with this present group on account of the possibility of demonstrating correlations between laboratory work and the individual's reactions in social intercourse particularly when there has been falsification upon the witness stand in general we may say that while we have seen normal individuals who are not falsifiers do just as badly as a number of these individuals yet for the group the findings are exceedingly bad perhaps the best way of stating it would be to say that not one case shows the sturdily honest type of response which is frequently met with during the course of testing other delinquents even as young as the youngest of the cases cited here our findings stand in great contrast we note to the results of other test work 
when looking at the table given above we see that a large share of our nineteen normal cases are up to the average in general ability and yet as a group they fall far below the average on this testimony test take cases eight and nine for instance both of them bright girls with indeed considerable ability in many directions and yet both of them give a large number of extremely incorrect items in reporting what they saw in the osage picture and also both accept a very large proportion of the suggestions offered it seems as if frequently in these cases there is no real attempt to discriminate what was actually seen in the picture from what might have been in a butcher shop in most cases the fictitious items were given upon questioning but without the offering of suggestions when the individual was allowed to give merely free recital the result was better this however follows the general rule a general survey of work on other tests has not shown anything immediately significant in correlations and this makes the result upon the osage much more notable perhaps it may be argued that if these individuals had been told to key themselves up to do this test well being forewarned that otherwise it would reveal their weaknesses they could have done better some hint of this may be seen in our story of the results of the tests in case three but of course the same might be argued about the other test work where no such tendency to poor results was discernible the following table with a word of explanation will serve to bring out results on this test clearly to even the reader unfamiliar with the specific details of this subject a general description of the test is found in our introduction what follows is a table of four columns the first is headed case and gives the case number the next is headed items reported and has two sub columns free recital and on questioning the third heading is items incorrect under that are number and percent the fourth heading is suggestions with the subheading denominator equals number offered numerator equals number accepted so it would read this way on case sixteen sixteen responses were given on free recital with two totally fictitious on questioning twelve responses were given with one totally fictitious of the items incorrect there were three for ten per cent of the responses suggestions two out of seven were accepted in case fifteen ten items were given on free recital with none in error on questioning fourteen items were given with three in error the total number incorrect was three or twelve per cent of the total two out of five suggestions were accepted case four twelve responses were given on free recital all correct on questioning twenty eight responses with six incorrect six total incorrects or fifteen per cent of the responses three out of four suggestions were accepted in case nineteen fifteen items were given on free recital with two incorrect eight items were given on questioning with two incorrect four incorrect responses for seventeen per cent of the total four of the six suggestions were accepted for case three seventeen responses were given on free recital with two incorrect twenty on questioning with five incorrect seven incorrect responses or nineteen per cent of the total none of the six suggestions were accepted in case seven eleven responses on free recital with two incorrect on questioning seventeen with four incorrect six incorrect or twenty one per cent of the responses two of the five suggestions were accepted in case six seventeen responses on free recital with one incorrect twelve on questioning with six incorrect seven incorrect for twenty four per cent of the total one of seven suggestions was accepted in case thirteen eight items were given on free recital all correct on questioning twenty one were given with seven incorrect seven incorrect for twenty four per cent of the total four of the four suggestions were accepted in case eight sixteen free recital responses all correct on questioning twenty eight responses with twelve incorrect twelve incorrect total for twenty seven per cent of all the responses five of the seven suggestions were accepted in case nine twelve items were given on free recital all correct on questioning thirty-two were given with twelve incorrect 
12 and correct is 27 percent of all the responses six of the seven suggestions were accepted in case 14 seven items were given on free recital all correct on questioning 21 were given with eight incorrect the eight incorrect is 28 percent of the total responses four of the seven suggestions were accepted in case two ten responses were given on free recital all correct on questioning twelve were given with seven incorrect seven incorrect is thirty two percent of all responses one of the five suggestions was accepted in case twenty six items were given on free recital all correct nine were given on questioning eight incorrect the eight incorrect is fifty three percent of the total two of the five suggestions were accepted that's the end of the table only thirteen of our nineteen mentally normal cases were found to have had the osage test done so uniformly that results could be fairly compared as in the above table the reader will find it easy to refer back to the case for noting other correlations with behavior in the first double column the items which were given on free recital come first and in the second part of the number of positive responses to questions by the examiner the coefficients attached to these represent the number of egregious errors or entirely fictitious items given it should be clearly understood that slight deviations from facts for instance in color are not accounted as errors for our present purposes in a later study on this whole topic of the psychology of testimony there will be much more complete itemizing the errors in which we are particularly interested can perhaps be called pure inventions in the next double column is given first the total number of incorrect items and then the percentage of these to the total number of items reported in the last column suggestibility is dealt with we have been accustomed to offer seven suggestions asking the individual whether such and such things which might well be in the butcher shop really appeared in the picture for several reasons not all of the seven suggestions were asked in every case therefore the result is best viewed as a statement in fractions the numerator being the number of suggestions accepted and the denominator the number of suggestions offered as a last statement on this question which we put to ourselves namely whether pathological liars show the same traits in the laboratory as they do on the witness stand or in general social life we can answer in the affirmative we may repeat that others have made as bad records as some of this group, but taking the group as a whole, it is unlike any random 13 cases which might be picked out from our other classes of mentally normal offenders. On the other hand, many a feeble-minded testifier has done vastly better than the median of this group. The errors themselves are of the purely inventional type, such as your ordinary report from a mentally normal person does not contain there is perhaps one interesting exception to this case three the report given by this subject included egregious denials of some of the main objects in the picture and so was fictitious to this extent she did not say that she did not know whether these to be expected objects really were in the picture she insisted that they were not so far as suggestibility is concerned there are great differences among even normal people in all classes for comparison with the above group we may take sixty-three cases of mentally normal delinquents all of whom had been offered the full seven suggestions the median error of this group was two lower than the fraction thus obtained was the result on only four of the present cases we have been interested to see that with some of the pathological liars there is no great suggestibility the person is willing to deal in his own inventions but not with false ideas which others attempt to put in his mind diagnosis the essentials for the diagnosis of pathological lying are contained in the definition at the beginning of our book the above considerations of the physical and mental makeup of pathological liars should leave little question as to what belongs in this class of course here as in the study of any mental traits borderline cases difficult to discriminate will always be found sometimes one will not be able to determine whether the individual is a true pathological liar or merely a prevaricator for a normal purpose we have already stated our inability to determine this in some cases and yet the nucleus of the type stands out sharply and clearly and there can be no doubt as to what is practically meant by the definition 
the differential diagnosis involves consideration of the characteristics of the insane defective and epileptic we repeat that we agree that the mentally abnormal person may engage in pathological lying quite apart from any expression of delusions and that during the course of such lying the insanity may not be recognized this occurred in many of the cases cited in the foreign literature and if the prior histories of many individuals now in insane hospitals were known undoubtedly such lying would be frequently noted but once the person is recognized as insane he need not be classified as a pathological liar this term should be reserved as we stated previously for normal individuals who engage in pathological lying of course other observers have noted such lying in people who could not be designated as being mentally abnormal but our material is peculiarly rich in examples of this kind correlations studied for causes heredity we come now to a very interesting group of facts showing at once complete corroboration of previous observer statements that pathological liars are extraordinarily erbliche belastet taking our nineteen mentally normal cases we find the following insanity in the direct family four of these being apparent six one or both parents severely alcoholic six criminal or very dissolute parent four suicide of parent one extremely neuropathic parent one syphilitic parent two epileptic parent one unsatisfactory data two reliable data showing normal family stock two thus out of the nineteen cases there are only three or four which do not come of stock showing striking defects now as we go on to show later that unfortunate conditions or experiences were often causal factors the total findings seem to show clearly that these latter influences generally bore their unfortunate fruition upon inherited instability the heredity in the borderline cases is as might be expected even worse these facts are easily discerned in their respective case histories the question of inheritance of similar mental traits is of course important we have found absolutely no proof of the trait of pathological lying as such being inherited the reader will note with interest particularly the facts in cases two and four where we at first thought we had to deal with inheritance but later found there was no blood relationship between the supposed parent and child in those instances the lying of the younger individual was much more likely to be the result of psychic contagion and this also may be largely the explanation of cases six and eight where an older relative was well known to be a prevaricator the bad inheritance in these cases then turns out to be corroborating what we found in studying the general problem of criminality a matter of coming from stock that shows defects in various ways all making however in the offspring for moral instability developmental physical conditions inquiry into our nineteen mentally normal cases gave the following findings antenatal conditions were defective in two cases on account of syphilis and in one case from advanced age of the mother the accident during pregnancy to the mother in one case the severe mental shock in another and the effect of illegitimacy in still another we cannot evaluate in two cases there were operative births with however no bad results known one was a twin early severe disease of the nervous system was experienced by one and convulsions during infancy by two others another suffered from some unknown very severe early illness and one from prolonged digestive disturbance in infancy three had in early childhood several severe illnesses one had a long attack of chorea two suffered from general nervousness incited in one case by the excessive use of tea and in the other by a similar use of coffee one was an habitual masturbator from childhood difficult menstruation was reported in only one case in five cases there was a quite normal early developmental period according to reliable accounts in three cases the early developmental histories are completely unknown and in three others uncertain the data of developmental history in the borderline types may be easily noted in the case histories previous ailments 
ailments suffered from in our nineteen cases after the early developmental period amount to very little the several gynecological troubles have been mentioned above under the head of physical conditions in one other case there had been urethritis previously head injuries which play such a significant part in the study of criminalistics find no place in our mentally normal series but should always be kept in mind in considering the borderline types epilepsy as a possible factor in criminalistic problem cases is to be remembered habits we have already mentioned the effect upon nervous conditions of excessive tea and coffee in two of our cases masturbation including its indirect effect particularly upon the psyche appears to be very important feature of these cases we should be far from considering that we have full data on all of our cases and yet this stands out most strongly we have had positive reports from relatives or from the individual showing this certainly to be a factor in seven out of the nineteen cases this is a very large finding when it is considered that the data are frequently unobtainable of course we are not speaking here of masturbation per se but only the fact of its ascertained relationship to the pathological lying this is only part of the whole matter of sex experience which we find upon gathering our material together plays such an enormous role age of onset it is very easy to see that the tendency to pathological lying begins in the early formative years common sense observation of general character building would tend to make us readily believe that if an individual got through the formative years of life with a normal hold upon veracity he would never become a pathological liar we can see definite beginnings at certain critically formative periods as in case six and perhaps in case three but our material shows that most cases demonstrate more gradually insidious beginnings case twenty one is in this respect in a class by itself as we stated in our introduction it is clear from the previous studies of older individuals that the nature of the beginnings were not learned because it was too late our material offers unusual opportunities in this direction and shows the fact of genesis in childhood most clearly for specific and often most interesting details we refer the reader to our various case histories sex our findings show only one male out of nineteen mentally normal cases a general observation by practical students of conduct namely that females tend to deviate from the truth more readily than males is more than thoroughly borne out here there are certainly several social and psychological reasons for this but they need not be gone into here if our figures seem not to be corroborated by the findings of previous studies it is only because the figures are not comparable the latter have mixed the mentally abnormal with the pathological liars proper it will be noted that in our examples of borderline cases five out of the eight are males cases of pathological swindling by mentally abnormal individuals such as we have avoided make up much of the foreign literature we can easily see that the social opportunities for swindling are vastly greater for males than those offered to the opposite sex sex differences as in many instances must not be taken here too seriously because social environment differing so greatly for the sexes is largely responsible for the behavior which we superficially judge to be entirely the expression of innate characteristics environment we are far from feeling that a mere enumeration of material environmental conditions tells the story of environmental influences important to our present subject the psyche is frequently most profoundly affected by environmental conditions which even a trained observer would not detect but conditions in the total number of unselected cases show something and for whatever it is worth we offer the following enumeration of environment in our nineteen normal cases who with much more reason might be expected to be largely influenced by surroundings than our group of borderline cases reasonably good home from birth five defective home conditions through poverty two very ignorant parents two immoralities in home life six marked defect in parental control six very erratic home conditions parent abnormal one early mental experiences 
as will have been observed by the reader in going over the case histories the early mental experiences of many of our group of mentally normal pathological liars have been shockingly bad full appreciation of this can only be gained through perusal of the text but here we may call attention to the fact that no less than eight of the nineteen have had very early untoward sex experiences that five were markedly under the influence of bad companions including even the influence in one or two cases of vicious grown people the sex experiences we have just enumerated were received through others we are not here speaking of masturbation which is discussed above psychic contagion direct contagion of the tendency to lie seems more than likely to take place at least during the more plastic periods of life it may be that this only develops when there is some sort of predisposition to instability our related findings on defective heredity would seem to indicate the fact it should be noted that in five instances out of our nineteen mentally normal cases two four six eight and twenty some other member of the household we learned from reliable sources was known as a chronic prevaricator mental conflicts the fact that several of our cases started lying from the time when there occurred some experience accompanied by a deep emotional context and that this experience and the emotion was repressed seems to point clearly to the part which repressed mental life may play in the genesis that as children they kept to themselves secrets of grave import and dwelled long on them shows in a large number of our cases anything deeply upsetting such as the discovery of the facts of sex life or questions about family relationships are the incidents which cause the trouble for students of modern psychology nothing more need be said on this point the concrete issues are perceivable in the case histories adolescence quite apart from the age of onset we may consider the physical and psychical instabilities of adolescence as effective causes of pathological lying of course it is equally true that many other tendencies to peculiarity are accentuated at this period it has been suggested that cases which have their origin largely in the unstable reactions of adolescence have much the better prognosis but it seems that not enough evidence has been accumulated as yet to justify us in this conclusion which we acknowledge may prove to be true irritative conditions in the same way the various types of irritative conditions physical and mental may be considered as exciting moments individuals with a tendency to pathological lying will no doubt show aggravation of the phenomenon at periods of particular stress we have heard it suggested in several cases by relatives that the menstrual period for instance brings about an excess of tendency to prevarication we would grant the point without conceding this exciting factor to be a fundamental cause case twenty one we may say again illustrates a special fact the periodicity which stemmerman makes much of may merely mean succumbing during a period of psychological stress social stress also may be met by pathological lying in the same way that the individual who finds himself in a tight place may attempt to get out of it by running away we have already spoken of the likeness of social and physical stress as showing when the weak individual is brought to bay that pathological lying does not run an even course but shows remarkable fluctuations with powerful exacerbations is undoubtedly to be explained by changes of inner and outer stress habit formation the influence of habit in causing chronicity must always be definitely reckoned with it is hardly necessary to say more than a word on the subject even the individual as in cases eight nine and ten comes to strongly realize it particularly is this point to be estimated in considering the possibilities of a rapid cure special mental abilities once more for the sake of completeness in giving a category of causes we should call attention to the fact acknowledged by all thorough students of this subject namely that other conditions being equal it is particularly the individual who has linguistic abilities who is especially good at verbal composition that seems to have most incentive to dally with the truth but beyond this we would insist that a combination of verbal ability with proportionate mental defects in other fields gives a make-up which finds the paths of least resistance directly along the lines of prevarication 
Social Correlations The role played in society by the pathological liar is very striking. The characteristic behavior in its unreasonableness is quite beyond the ken of the ordinary observer. The fact that here is a type of conduct regularly indulged in without seeming pleasurable results and frequently militating obviously against the direct interests of the individual makes a situation inexplicable by the usual canons of inference. To a certain extent, the tendencies of each separate case must be viewed in their environmental context to be well understood. For example, the lying and swindling, which center about the assumption of a noble name and a corresponding station, or affecting the life of a cloister brother, such as we find in the cases cited by Longard, show great differences from any material obtainable in our country. In interpretation of this, one has to consider the glamour thrown about the socially exalted or the life of the recluse, a glamour which obtains readily among the simple-minded people of rural Europe. Then, too, this very simple-mindedness, with the great differences which exist between peasant and noble, leads in itself to much opportunity for cheating. With us, especially in the newer work of courts, which are rapidly becoming in their various social endeavors more and more intimately connected with many phases of life, the pathological liar becomes of main interest in the role of accuser of others, self-accuser, witness, and general social disturber. Here again we may call attention to the fact which is of great social importance, namely that the person who is seemingly normal in all other respects may be a pathological liar. It might be naturally expected that the feeble-minded, who frequently have poor discernment of the relation of cause and effect, including the phenomena of conduct, would often lie without normal cause. As a matter of fact, there is surprisingly little of this among them, and one can find numerous mental defectives who are faithful tellers of the truth, while even, as we have found by other studies, some are good testifiers. Exaggerated instances of the type presented by Case 12, where the individual, by virtue of language ability, endeavors to maintain a place in the world which his abilities do not otherwise justify and where the very contradiction between abilities and disabilities leads to the development of an excessive habit of lying, are known in considerable number by us. Many of these mentally defective verbalists do not even grade high enough to come in our borderline cases, and yet frequently, by virtue of their gift of language, the world in general considers them fairly normal. They are really on a constant social strain by virtue of this and while they are not purely pathological liars, they often indulge in pathological lying, a distinction we have endeavored to make clear in our introduction. It stands out very clearly, both in previous studies of this subject and in viewing our own material, that pathological lying is very rarely the single offense of the pathological liar. The characteristics of this lying show that it arises from a tendency which might easily express itself in other forms of misrepresentation. Swindling, sometimes stealing, sometimes running away from home, assuming another character and perhaps another name, may be the results of the same general causes in the individual. The extent to which these other delinquencies are carried on by a pathological liar depends again largely upon environmental conditions. For instance, truancy is very difficult in German cities. A long career of thieving under the better police surveillance of some European countries is less possible than with us, while swindling, for the reason given above, seems easier there. Running away from home and itineracy show in a wonderfully strong correlation with pathological lying, both in previous studies and in our own material. Several authors, particularly Stemmermann, in her survey of the subject, comment on this. This phenomenon, not only on account of the numerical findings, but also from a logical standpoint, is easily seen to be the expression in another form of conduct of the essential tendencies of the pathological liar. It is part of the general character, instability, the unwillingness to meet the realities of life, the inclination to escape consequences. As a matter of fact, frequently the pathological liar gets himself in a tight place by lying, 
and then the easiest escape is by running away from the scene the delinquencies of our present group as given below can with profit be compared with our previous statistics on a large group of offenders we gathered the facts concerning a series of one thousand carefully studied youthful repeated offenders of six hundred ninety four male offenders two hundred and sixty one were guilty of running away to the extent that it made a more or less serious offense of three hundred six female offenders seventy six committed the same type of offense for comparison with the present group it is to be remembered that eighteen out of the nineteen mentally normal pathological liars were females running away normal cases twelve borderline six stealing normal seven borderline six swindling normal seven borderline two vagrancy normal zero borderline four attempted suicide normal zero borderline two sex offenses normal eight borderline one false accusations normal ten borderline four self accusations normal three borderline two abortion normal one borderline zero we have given figures on false accusations here including other cases than were enumerated in our special chapter on the subject in that chapter the center of interest was on the false accusation but it is true that in certain other cases of pathological lying false accusations were indulged in as a somewhat minor offense the nine cases enumerated as swindlers showed this offense in varying degrees as might naturally be expected by the difference in ages which if nothing else makes for variations in the evolution of social and character tendencies perusal of the cases shows the small beginnings as well as the flagrant offenses on this order as we previously have stated we have avoided dealing with the older careers of notorious swindlers the nature of the sex offenses can be learned from the case histories by those who wish to make special inquiry masturbation we have regarded more as a causative factor and have spoken of it in a previous section truancy we have not enumerated it goes without saying that it had been indulged in by practically all of the males and by a considerable number of the females in our cases the observer of delinquents cannot help being constantly impressed by the fact that the offense of lying seems to the usual offender small in proportion to the commission of other criminalistic deeds particularly does this come out when one observes the chronic liar growing up in a household where grave sex and other delinquencies are habitual occurrences should his lying be compared with those major antisocial transactions indeed it might be a field for speculation as to whether given certain qualities of mind imaginative powers etc pathological lying may not play the part of a vicarious delinquency being to the delinquent apparently less pernicious than more objective offences in our case histories may be seen some indications of this prognosis treatment in discussing prognosis and treatment we can eliminate at once considerations of pathological lying by the insane the outcome there depends upon what can be done for the underlying psychosis we have avoided intimate discussion of these cases but many suggestions of the unalterableness of the full-fledged tendencies among the insane are found in the european literature cited by us even discussion of the outcome of the borderline cases such as we have given examples of needs but short shrift everyone knows the extreme difficulties of dealing with constitutional inferiors marked cases are socially fit only for proper colonization the epileptic in default of cure of his disease is ever going to be prone to many peculiar mental states which may involve pathological lying the slight mental confusion of chorea which may lead to false accusation as we have seen in case twenty three is one of the most curable of all abnormal mental states with proper attention to diagnosis and treatment favorable outcome of cases of hysteria such as that in case twenty four is frequently seen another type which cannot be handled except by permanent segregation is the thoroughly aberrational and socially dangerous class represented by case twenty five 
however one designates the type much more undoubtedly can be done for such a borderline individual as case twelve if there is sufficient cooperation among educational and reformatory institutions and the courts it has seemed to us that the chief cause of failure in this interesting case has been the fact that this young man could go on ever entertaining new social situations and finding new worlds for exploitation because no one had the means at hand for securing facts concerning his past or for ascertaining what any good diagnostician could easily perceive to be his limitations and tendencies very much more to the point is consideration of the actual and possible outcome in cases of pathological lying by normal individuals here as in other matters where bodily mental and social issues are blended no prognosis or outlook can be rationally offered without consideration of possible changes in the circumstances peculiar to the given case first and foremost stands out the fact that cure of the tendency sometimes happens even after long giving way to it in this statement we are not contradictory to some previous writers as stemmerman says out of the general literature there is not much from which one can deduce any principles of prognosis but again we would insist that one of the great weaknesses has been that earlier studies have not carefully distinguished between the mentally normal and the abnormal cases of pseudologia fantastica when for instance forel speaks of pathological liars as being constitutionally abnormal individuals who are not curable he fails to differentiate where profitable differentiation can be made if our own work is of any practical value it is in offering safer grounds for prognosis and treatment stemmerman summarizes well her follow-up work done upon cases seen years previously by other observers some of these are still in institutions after a period of well-doing several of these have become backsliders and reverted again to lying and swindling very few appear to have been cured but yet some of the facts of betterment are most convincing this author states that at the most one dares to ponder over the point as to whether there are not cases which recover particularly when the pathological lying is a phenomenon of adolescence our own material is in part too recently studied to form anything like a generalization concerning prognosis many years have to elapse before one can be sure there is not going to be a recurrence but one is not altogether certain that prognostic generalizations are of practical worth for this group of mentally normal pathological liars so many incidental factors of physical mental and social life with all of the complicated background of the same come in to make the total result that experiment and trial with the individual case while hesitating to give an exact prognosis is perhaps the only sane procedure what we do know definitely is the immensely favorable outcome in cases one four seven nineteen and the promising betterment in several other instances all in direct contradiction to what we had expected from a survey of the previous literature in several of these cases the years have gone by with nothing but steady improvement the difficulty in getting adequate treatment either in home life or by necessary individual attention elsewhere makes it impossible to say that many of the others also could not have been favorably influenced frequently a total alteration of environmental conditions is necessary and this of course is often very difficult to obtain also it is extremely rare that one can get the whole matter and its sure social consequences fairly and squarely met by anybody with influence over the individual until this can be done little in the way of good results may ever be expected the splendid attack made by relatives or others upon the situation in cases one four seven possibly fourteen and nineteen tells the story of the prime necessity for adequate handling of pathological lying specific treatment of physical conditions should always be undertaken when necessary it should go without saying that any individual who is open to the temptations of inner stress should be strengthened at all points possible and relieved from all sources of irritation but 
lest any one should become too much persuaded of the efficacy of surgical or other treatment it should be remembered that the psychical reactions even where there is physical irritation involve the definite wearing of neural paths with habit formation which bodily treatment can only slightly alter an enticing problem to the gynecologist is always the relationship of pelvic particularly sexual irritations to conduct we cannot confirm the idea of a prime causal connection of this particular although we have evidence that betterment of the physical ailment may lead to less inclination towards the unfortunate behavior in case one the lying came long before pelvic disease was acquired but very likely the irritation of the latter led to an accentuation of the psychical phenomena in case six the typical conduct was persisted in after remedy of the pelvic disorder so also in case three after relief of abdominal conditions and in case twenty one after cessation of pregnancy other points bearing upon this may be read in our case histories on the general problem of the possibility of physical treatment it will be noted that a considerable share of all our cases were in good general condition in discussing treatment great emphasis should be placed upon the primary necessity for directly meeting the pathological liar upon the level of the moral failures and making it plain that these are known and understood it is very certain that frequently this type of prevaricator has very little conception of the social antagonism which his habit arouses there is faulty apperception of how others feel towards the lying and to what depths the practice of this habit leads appreciation of these facts may be the first step towards betterment in several of the improved cases we have mentioned that it was largely the acquirement of social foresight which made the first step in a moral advance which finally won the day in this whole matter the first ethical instruction may well be based upon the idea of self-preservation after all the backbone of much of our morals when it comes to specific details of treatment these must be educational alterative and constructive in cases one and three under treatment we know that when the lying was discovered or suspected the individual was at once checked up and made to go over the ground and state the real facts the pathological liar ordinarily reacts to the accusation of lying by prevaricating again in self-defense but when with the therapeutist there has been the understanding that the tendency to lying is a habit which it is necessary to break the barricade of self-defense may not be thrown up an alternative measure of great value then is directly to meet the specific lie on the spot as it were when it is told next accuracy of report may well be practiced as a special discipline in these normal cases we have seen that there could be little doubt about the individual having self-control enough to stick to the truth if the will was properly directed indeed many of our cases were exceptionally bright individuals with many good powers of observation and memory had one the opportunity there can be little doubt but that training in the power to do well on such a test as that afforded by the osage picture would have yielded good results indeed there is some suggestion of this in our table of findings on this test where we note the pathological liars when left merely to themselves and their first often comparatively meagre report on the picture give few incorrect details the difference in their report as compared with other observers of the picture was found when they answered questions since this is the case there can be little question that training in the power to respond accurately might be gained it may be of value in considering therapeutics of pathological lying to enumerate the general run of treatment which was carried out in those instances where we knew that betterment took place nearly always only a part of what we advised could be carried out but even so a brief statement of the conditions under which betterment was accomplished seems worth much case one was treated first in an institution for delinquents where every effort was made to cure her disease and where she was taught to employ herself in constructive work it was found she had ability to design and this was used to the utmost 
then her lying tendencies were checked by social disapprobation as much as possible a special effort was made toward this the girl was undoubtedly made more serious-minded by the after-effects of her experience and perhaps by her disease she was later successfully handled at home by her sensible mother leaving the years of adolescent instability behind her was also undoubtedly a factor in betterment case four was taken in hand by a sterling character who restrained very carefully the tendency to lying and by firm methods showed her the social advantages of self-control in this respect at the same time she was given a vastly better environment particularly in the matter of her friends however there is little doubt that nothing would have been accomplished in this case without first a deep understanding of the girl's troubles and of her mental conflicts case seven was treated for her sex difficulties under the constant care of a vigorous mother who first naturally had to gain an understanding of the case with her bettered physical and mental conditions the girl was able steadily to hold a position for which earlier she had no capacity betterment in case fourteen came about mainly as the result of an understanding of the child's mental conflicts and somewhat through partially bettered environmental conditions we learned lately that the severe visual defect had been neglected in case fifteen the false accusations were made upon the basis of mental conflict investigation of the case followed by the personal services of a probation officer and by the legal proceedings served to clear up conditions including those of the family in general so that the girl was given a greater chance of success case nineteen seems to have been largely cured through the girl herself being able to work out her mental conflicts adolescence was a factor and she was tided over this period in a good environment and with friends who understood her type of case and who were willing to put up with her aberrancies for this time although we would not minimize the efforts of stalwart friends we may say that there were more evidences of cure by self-help in this case than in any other we have seen lest we should seem to be placing too much emphasis upon adolescence with the idea that the mere passing of that period will lead to change in behavior we cite cases three five and six where the addition of years has brought no betterment in neither of these was the essential nature of the difficulty explored during earlier troublous periods an interesting consideration for treatment is embodied in the rational idea of utilizing the special powers so that there may be ample gratification in self-expression and in use of the imagination through this new satisfaction there may be a mental swerving from the previous paths strewn with pitfalls the inclination to verbal composition already spoken of as existing in so many cases may be utilized and imagination be given full sway in harmless directions it seems likely that just this deliberate practice may serve to more clearly demarcate truth from falsehood in the individual's mind unfortunately we have had too little actual proof of the value of this method some cases being worked on now are too recent for report but there is plenty of indication of the possibilities had we been able to control environment better much more of this type of work would have been carried out a favorable outcome through this constructive treatment based upon utilizing the characteristic linguistic powers of the pathological liar is witnessed to by stemmerman in her history of delbrook's g n in the history of this case a delightful note of comedy is struck g n was found to be a man of considerable literary ability he had been observed over the period of thirteen years after he was first studied he twice managed to go three years without succumbing to his falsifying tendencies and then found his chance for leading a blameless life by becoming a newspaper man in fact he reached an honored place as an editor stemmerman suggests naively that perhaps this calling is especially calculated to give the talents correlated with pseudologia fantastica space for free play so that the individual's special abilities may not come in conflict with the law or with social customs and on the other hand may be utilized in fruitful pursuits 
Altogether, one could certainly advise every effort being made towards specifically stabilizing the pathological liar in the matter of truth-telling by checking the springs of misconduct and by diverting energies and talents into their most suitable channels. The problem must ever be one for individual therapy. Failures of treatment there may be, but from our study we are much inclined to believe that well-calculated, constructive efforts will achieve goodly success among those who are mentally normal. This is the end of Chapter 6 and the end of pathological lying, accusation, and swindling as a whole. Read by Mary Schneider in Havana, Florida in September of 2010.